All right, hi guys, uh, take two. I just did a 30 minute video, uploaded it onto YouTube and found it was only three minutes and 30 seconds long. So something got interrupted, I don't know how. So I'm doing my entire lecture over again, yay. Okay, so before I get started, um, you know, somebody mentioned, uh, somebody made a comment uh, when I complained about the audio on this computer not being good. Um, and said they'd be willing to help me out. Uh, it's really not a question of know-how. I'm pretty nerdy and I know how to get around computers. Uh, it's just that uh, combination of uh, bad purchases and really not having the funds to go out and get high quality equipment. So as a result, I bought this Chromebook. It turns out that the Chromebook has uh, really good uh, video. It's pretty decent for a webcam, but the audio is horrible. Uh, my Dell laptop, on the other hand, uh, has uh, good audio, but not good video on the webcam. And yes, I do have a USB mic uh, that I uh, plugged into this uh, Google Chromebook. And um, it, uh, the, the operating system will not read it, uh, which gets me to one more side point is that um, do not ever buy a, a computer with the uh, Chrome OS. It is so Google pr proprietary, it's ridiculous. They are trying to own the digital world, Google. And for good reason, you know, they're working for the NSA after all. Anyway, um, so, uh, you know, I, I just want to recommend that this, this computer, it's a cute little computer. And if you're a student or something like that, it's a good cheap computer to, uh, to uh, you know, do your homework on. You get Google Docs and Google this and Google that. So, uh, you know, fine. But uh, if you really are a computer operator and you know what you're doing with the computer, do not get this. Uh, I, um, you cannot get into the BIOS of this computer. Uh, in order for Linux to boot from a thumb drive, you have to get into the BIOS of the computer before the operating system boots and tell it, look, when you sniff out a thumb drive, load that first. And uh, wouldn't do it. There is no way to hit F10 or something while the computer is booting. It's, in fact, there are no F keys on this computer. This is ridiculous. This is like really bullshit. Anyway, okay, but that aside, enough reason to get the blues. Today, uh, we're going to be broaching the subject of the blues, and uh, I'm not going to use uh, 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 musical examples in this particular lecture because what I'm doing is an overview on the views, uh, on the blues, and... Um, the important salient points uh, that I call the blues clues. And uh, in the future videos, I'm going to hit each one of these points I'm talking about today, and I'm going to drill deep down inside of them so you'll get uh, an idea of what, what it is exactly I'm talking about. Uh, first thing I, I do want to talk about, and this will explain kind of why uh, I'm doing these lectures and what is wrong with academic studies in that they're not uh, synergistic, they're not holistic, they don't bring in all elements. Um, we have to talk about the Industrial Revolution. Now, any kind of revolution, be it a digital revolution of today or the Industrial Revolution at the turn of the 20th century, these revolutions are not what they are by name. In other words, the Industrial Revolution is not just about industry. That's what they labeled it. It was a revolution in thinking. This is when existentialism started to happen. This is when uh, 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 we moved from Romanticism in the classical period into what was called the Impressionist period. And in fact, the Impressionist painters as well came about around this era. Uh, the musical Impressionism was a very short-lived moment in music, um, but uh, uh, the actual art, uh, fine art Impressionism lasted a longer time. Uh, there were, was a revolution in communications, electronics, uh, uh, people became more and more aware of the other cultures of the world. It was a revolution in everything, not just industry, but, you know, capitalism as it is, it's an industrial revolution, uh, BS. All right. And yeah, if we look at the digital revolution, for example, it's, it's right. The source of it is digital. No question about it, especially in uh, the digital revolution. It does actually go by its name in this particular instance. Uh, when we think about the digital revolution, we have to say, well, there have been changes in music because of digital 
uh, processing. There have been changes in the arts uh, with Photoshop and stuff like this, uh, changes in the way we communicate, changes in business with these new uh startup companies and apps and all like this delete snapchat please they destroyed my little community here and they're and and the startup companies are continuing to destroy my community here because this is basically a bohemian arts community and these asshole startups have no freaking idea what this community is about and they just came in and said hey let's let's own this place it's cool and now the artists are suffering because the rents have gone sky high you can't buy a hamburger for under 10 bucks and it's just ridiculous. So um, I'm very resentful of that aspect of the digital revolution. A lot of good came from it too, but uh, such as the ability uh, for me to communicate to you via YouTube. All right, so the changes that were brought about in the industrial revolution. Now uh, we were after temperament in the 1700s, uh, we were introduced to what we call the major minor key system. Prior to that, in the days of the Greek modes, there was no such thing as a major key or a minor key, all right? Uh, the major or minor quality was determined by what step of the, the scale that uh, you're, you're creating your scale from. So in a C scale, if I go from the C note to the C note, yes, that's major, but if I start on the D note, I get a minor scale. So who says that the C note is the proprietary, the ultimate note to start the scale? Nobody can. It's like looking at a circle that's perfectly drawn and saying, okay, where was that circle started? You can't say, all right? Music itself is a circle and better put, it's a spiral. Uh, all right, so in any case, um, the impressionists moved out of the romantic period, wanted to do something different. So the likes of Claude Debussy and Maurice Ravel began to resurrect the old Greek modes and place them into uh, the musical form of the time. Uh, but at the same time, because of the revolution in communication as well, now through radio and other forms, the wax record and stuff like this, we were able to uh, hear, uh, the Europeans were able to hear music from America and they found it like, oh my God, this is so exotic what these Americans are doing. Uh, basically that was jazz at the time, the popular music called jazz. Um, and ragtime and blues and all of this. Now, this brings me to the point that all American music is African American music. That, you know, finally, that is the bottom line. And in fact, when you take some of the European forms that came to America, say, for example, Irish folk music, well, yeah, you can still find that now in the Appalachians, but even that became uh, influenced by blues. And that's where we got the form called blue grass, the grass meaning country, blue referring to blues. In other words, they're adding the blue note and blues principles into the country music. So really, the source of all American music is black. That's final. That's the way it is. All right. Now, um, so the thing is, uh, you know, the changes that occurred in music were happening so fast. It was revolutionary. I mean, within a short period of time, we went from the old classical system to modernism, which brought in uh, Arnold Schoenfeld's totally dissonant uh, dodecaphonic serial system, uh, which was just pure, you know, at a point, pure noise. Uh, that's the way I see it personally. A lot of people will defend dissonance as being consonants. I think that's BS. Um, but uh, these changes happened so quick. Uh, people uh, in Europe were listening to American jazz and trying to replicate it, which is kind of funny in the early days. If you ever get a chance, see if you could YouTube, uh, uh, what was it called? The Ebony Concerto by Igor Stravinsky. That was his impression of jazz. And the way it sounds, it's like uh, Picasso during his Cubist period looking at at, at curves and, and painting curves, but with cube, with the cubist mentality, so you don't see the curves. Uh, the Ebony Concerto has no swing to it whatsoever. It um, has no blues in it. It's just a European impression of American music. It's horrible. It took quite some time before the Europeans to actually uh, to actually learn how to play blues uh, jazz correctly. Uh, if you take a, any music score. Uh, uh, of a film of, from the early 60s that was a European music score, score emulating jazz, 
listen to it. It's it's really corny and it just doesn't have the soul and essence of American jazz. It took a while. Uh, but then the Europeans got it and then the Japanese caught on and they're like trying to play jazz. And initially they were really stiff and couldn't get it. And now Japanese jazz musicians are just every bit as good as American jazz musicians. But uh, this is why the blues is important because it gave birth to jazz and it gave birth to rock and roll. And uh, if we lose the element of the blues in our popular music, I'm talking from an American standpoint here and I'm being a bit nationalist when I say this, but uh, American music will lose all of its character if the blues goes away from it. And it doesn't have to sound old school to be the blues. Uh, I've heard uh, EDM composers incorporating elements of gospel and blues into their music, and it's doable, and it's cool. I had a student who was an EDM composer ask me, what, what is this that these guys are doing here? And I said, dude, are these white guys? Because it sounds like this sounds like gospel, and this sounds like blues over here, and I'll show you why the blue note is being incorporated into their music. Totally cool stuff. Let's not lose the blues. This is really important. All right, so anyway, moving on. Uh, if we look at the history of these three systems I talk about, the first system was the Greek modes, and uh, that would be isolated keys because of temperament. Uh, uh, temperament didn't happen yet, so keys could, could not work together. Uh, it's very difficult to explain. If you do some research into temperament, you'll get what I'm saying. Um, but the keys are isolated from each other, meaning if I had an instrument uh, tuned perfectly to one key and I tried to modulate to a different key using that instrument, it would sound terribly out of tune. Uh, so the keys were isolated from each other. It took Bach and his cronies to come along in around the 1700s and start tweaking the chromatic scale in such a way that they created what was called, what is now called equal temperament, where uh, the distances between every single note in the chromatic series, the ratios are exactly the same because nature didn't give it to us that way. This gave us the ability to now, in one key, uh, piece of music, to incorporate notes and chords from other keys into that piece. I call this interactive keys. The first system is called isolated keys. The second system is called interactive keys because the, the keys will interact with one another, but uh, it's kind of like like the internet, we can interact, but we can't be in the same space. Uh, similarly, with the interactive keys of the major minor key system, I could have four bars of music that goes out of the key for a moment, but then eventually comes back to the key I was in. Unless, of course, it's a dedicated modulation to a different key. But the idea is here, you can incorporate elements from other keys, but they're like modular units, okay? For a moment, I'm in A minor, but then I go back to the key of G. Um, it's not as if the key of A minor and the key of G are blending together as one thing to create a new sound. And this is where the third system, the blues, comes into being. This, you're literally blending keys together. This is totally revolutionary and ignored by the academics altogether. Okay, so we have the isolated keys, interactive keys, and blended keys, or the Greek modes, the major minor key system we all know and love, and the blues, all right? And this uh, part of the series, of course, will be about blues. Now I want to talk about the blues clues. Uh, the blues clues are little fingerprints that the blues left uh, to let us know um, certain, the, um, that, uh, how can I put it? These are the traditions of the blues, certain little traditional things that happened that made the blues so revolutionary and so counter to European harmony. Um, first blues clue, the one dominant seventh chord. Now we know there are three chord types, major, minor, and seventh, but in the first two systems, the seventh chord was meant to go somewhere. It was never meant to be the root chord of a chord progression, the chord you go home to and end the song on. Now granted in classical music and European harmony, uh, for effect, they would end on a seventh chord, but the, but the effect was such that you were left hanging in the air. A great example of that would be uh, the Beatles song, For No One. Uh, listen to the last two chords. It ends on the five dominant seventh chord, or the five chord at least, and it doesn't go home. It doesn't relax. This gives you a feeling of suspension. You've never 
kind of resolve the situation. Well, in the blues, you're able to go home to the seventh court and saying and say, I am resolved. This is the end. Uh, this alone is radical. This would never, ever be done in classical uh, European music. Uh, the second blues clue is minor under major. A minor, uh, a major chord progression, major key rooted chord progression with a minor scale melody being played under that. So I call it uh, uh, minor under major. Uh, chords take precedence over notes, all right? So uh, chords are like a gang of notes, so they have more power. And a bunch of chords will create an entire chord environment, meaning a root, a major minor, uh, or major or minor root that you go home to and then end the song on, okay? Um, in the blues, ostensibly, now a seventh chord is a major chord. It's just you're adding one note to it, and it gives it a slightly different character than the major chord. In fact, um, seriously different character because it's it has a certain amount of tension to it. Uh, and here they are playing the minor scale under this major chord environment or dominant seventh chord environment. That alone, that second point is another thing that would never ever be done in the old systems, okay? Um, uh, if you went to Bach and said, uh, oh, you got a major chord progression there, why don't you play a minor scale underneath that, see what it sounds like? Bach wouldn't even venture to do that, okay? He would not, uh, he would not uh, uh, find that to be, it would be so against the grain of standard thinking that it simply wouldn't be done. It wouldn't be considered. Okay. But the blues does just this. And in fact, if, uh, if Bach was around today, he'd probably totally dig it. Um, all right. Now, uh, the next blues clue is four dominant seven to one. What is four dominant seven? Uh, if we look at the chord family template, we know that the one, the four and the five chord are major. Whereas the, the five chord is dominant seven, but still major. Now what, uh, so in, in the key of C, we have C, F, and G. F to C is four to one. So the difference in blues is four dominant seven to one dominant seven. This four dominant seven to one uh, came from an old tradition. Uh, it has a name in classical, well, not the four to one without the dominant sevens. Uh, was called the plagal cadence in in, uh, in uh, classical music. And that's, instead of this, you get this. And uh, anybody who's old enough might remember the old church resolution. Amen. That was an old tradition, the plagal cadence and uh, church hymns. Now, this uh, tradition of ending on a plagal cadence was absorbed by the black community when they converted to Christianity back in the slave days. Some of them uh, began converting to Christianity and emulating the white churches. They took in the plagal cadence. And so you had four to one, the amen cadence. Now what differs and uh, is that the blues cadence is four dominant seven to one dominant seven. So just so you can hear the difference. And here's the blues cadence. Um, interestingly, the, the uh, uh, gospel adherents and the blues adherents were at odds with each other because the gospel people thought that the blues uh, music was sacrilegious because it dealt with themes of uh, lust and, and uh, such. So, uh, uh, you know, with the church Christianity thought that was bad stuff. But uh, this uh, four dominant seven to one dominant seven is a powerful earmark of the blues. Why it works is a mystery, and that's why I call these blues clues, because if it ends in a mystery, like the why of it, if it ends in a mystery, then there is no final theory. Um, I'm still working on a final theory for this. I haven't found it yet. Okay, so that's uh, blues clue number three, four dominant seven to one dominant seven resolution. Totally broke the rules, completely and utterly. Four never resolved to one in the uh, classical music, uh, European music tradition. Uh, four dominant seven to one dominant seven was even more of, of uh, adding insult to injury to that old theory. Uh, 
All right, the fourth blues clue is the blue note. And the blue note is an interesting study because when you're in a minor rooted situation, there's really only one blue note. But when you're in a major rooted uh, situation, there are up to three different types of blue note, all of which work really nicely. Um, I'll discuss that and we'll drill down into deep detail with this stuff uh, as we uh, further explore each of these points I'll get to. All right, the next blues clue is the sharp nine chord. Uh, the reason I bring this particular chord up is, um, ah, let's talk about the blues. We have minor against major. What do we know about major and what do we know about minor existentially? We know that major sounds happy. Ah, everything's okay and minor sounds serious and sad and uh, somber. Now, when you think about the blues, the blues is an emotional music and uh, it's bittersweet. It's got the major, which is the sweet, and the minor, which is the sad, blending together. And this is profound, all right? It's nothing short of profound because when, when for me, when I play the blues, it's a release. There's something emotional that I let go of when I play blues. And uh, there was a comedian I saw once that talked about um, how blues musicians are so weird because, you know, they're talking about their dog bit their leg off or their wife left, left them for their best friend or whatever, or the devil is chasing them. And yet when they're singing, they got a big old smile on their face. All right. That is the transformation that makes the blues. In other words, when you're, you must know as a musician, when you're feeling down and out, and nothing else is working in your life, you pick up your instrument and play and suddenly it feels like you got your mind off all that shit and you're you're feeling good again, at least for the moment. That's the beauty of music in general. All right, so the sharp nine chord contains both major and minor and dominant seven. So all now remember I said key blending. All three chords become blended together as one chord. And the interesting thing about the sharp nine chord is that you it's normally when you have an extended big chord up to the ninth you can find all the notes of that chord within one scale but with the blues you can't build a sharp nine chord with a with an official scale unless you incorporate two different scales and in this case it would be the natural minor and the harmonic minor uh, if you blend those two scales then you could borrow that one extra note that makes the sharp nine chord the sharp nine chord now uh, to get an earful of the sharp nine it's this all right and you may recognize it from Jimi hendrix That's, uh, they used to call this the Hendrix chord, and uh, when I was a kid, the ones that wanted to sound more sophisticated called it the major minor chord. Well, look, you can't call it a major minor chord, even though it has the major third of the major chord and the minor third of the minor chord. The reason why is because um, we build a seventh chord, root third, fifth, seventh, all right, and the nine would be F sharp. We have to call it the sharp nine when we raise that F sharp, even though it becomes the minor note of an E chord, like an E minor chord. Uh, if I play uh, E, B, G sharp, all right, that's the major note. If I play E, B, G, that's the minor note. So this is an E minor, this is an E major, right? But the problem, why not call it major minor? Because um, the, first of all, the essence of the chord is dominant, which is major bass. Secondly, when we build root third, fifth, seventh, we have to acknowledge this one note as being in the ninth position, root third, fifth, seventh, ninth. So it's called a sharp nine. Now this chord encompasses all about the blues. It's major, it's minor, and it's seventh. It's got all three chords built into one. And uh, it's extremely complex. Um, coolest chord ever, you know. Um, uh, Beatles used it early on, uh, the song You Can't Do That. Uh, uh, because I told you before, you can't do that. But it's also in the uh, song Tax Man. All right, so the sharp nine chord uh very very important intrinsic to the blues i call it the essence of blues harmony 
Uh, the next blues clue is extreme chromatic melodies. Now, you would think because the blues is so simple uh, in this. All right, let's talk about this. When I teach the blues, I say it's at one and the same time the simplest form to do and the most complex, sophisticated form to do. Um, why is it simple? Because if you have an A blues, you can play an A minor pentatonic to your heart's content as a global scale, and you don't have to think again, and you're just having all the fun in the world. But when you take the blues to uh, its, its deepest art form, okay, um, what you're doing is you're blending major and minor together in a, in a sonorous way, not an idiotic way. And um, as a result, well, one thing you can think of is this. The seventh chord itself is complicated. And here in the blues, we have one, four, five. All three of those chords are seventh chords. So just by that nature alone, we're creating immense complexity. I will explain in the future why you can use extreme chromaticism in the blues, meaning, you know, uh, when you play your pentatonic scale, you could fill in the middle notes to your heart's content and it will all sound good. Um, I will get to that in the future. All right. Uh, now, uh, another blues clue is uh, the pentatonic melodic basis, which is really a very natural thing. Now, I will say this, the blues really wasn't sourced in America um, at first. The blues came out of Mali in Africa. Uh, and when it was translated over here, uh, the Malians did not have um, temperament at the time, all right? And therefore, um, they didn't really have an understanding of harmonic movement in the European sense. It was a totally different tradition. So uh, when the black slaves were brought to America, especially the Malians, they hear in the mansion of the master's mansion, this piano, and they're going through all different chord changes and stuff like this. And they're listening, going, wow, wait a second, that's really cool. I'm going to try doing that. And in their naivete, they broke all the rules and created a new form without even knowing it. And uh, they sang their pentatonic melodies against these chords uh, that they created, these chord progressions. And this became the American blues, which is distinct from the Malian blues in, in very, very important ways. Uh, it's um, truly an American music, and it gave, worth, uh, gave birth to rock and roll and jazz. And I will say this one more time, we cannot lose the blues from the American tradition. If we lose the blues element, that includes blue note, sharp nine chords, the whole bit, all I've been discussing, if we lose this, there will be no music that we can characterize as being solely American. The EDM composers are going back to European harmony and not even creatively. They're playing what I call white key piano music, which is like no surprise chords. That's like taking one key and using all the chords of that key and boring, all right? Uh, all right, another uh, element of the blues, which was brand new uh, uh, went from the European perspective, was the swing rhythm. And the swing rhythm, any jazz musician will tell you, cannot be notated on paper. It's uh, somewhere across between eighth note triplet and uh, 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 dotted eighth sixteenth note, but it's it's not. It's somewhere in between. Um, and it's a feeling you can't write it down. A good one, somebody who's swinging the right way, you could just it's something you feel. And the final earmark of the blues, which was, again, you, you, nowadays we don't think twice about it, but improvisation was a brand new thing. I mean, when you look at these uh, Europeans that came over to America, they're doing like their Stephen Foster songs and stuff on the piano. They're not making anything up. They're reading straight off the paper. Improv became uh, a very, very important uh, exercise in American music forms. And in fact, this is why a lot of... Uh, great jazz musicians call jazz America's classical music. In a sense, it really, really is. It's our disciplined study of music. So I'm going to be hitting on all of these areas that I uh, uh, call blues clues, the list I just went through, and we'll go through them one by one. And uh, um, yeah, that'll be it. So uh, I'll see you guys in the future and be well.